So, <clears throat> welcome everyone. My name is Marta Gider-Pikarska. I'm Director of Ecosystem at Hyperledger. As you may know, Hyperledger is a project within the Linux Foundation. So actually, Open Source Summit is very close to my heart as it's organized by the Linux Foundation. Uh, and we are focused on permissioned blockchains. Uh, we have 16 different projects right now under the Hyperledger Greenhouse. And uh, the way that every Linux Foundation project is structured is that uh, there is the open source community, everybody that is contributing to the codes, to the working groups, to the special interest groups. And then there is the enterprise members uh, who are contributing also financially to sustaining the, uh, the projects, as well as contributing to the code and contributing by using our, uh, the, the frameworks and tools that are being developed. Uh, by the open source community. So it's my pleasure today to have representatives of two of our member companies. Uh, we have Douglas, uh, who is with Circular, and uh, Jijo, who is with Chainyard. So I will let you introduce yourselves. So please tell us who you are, what you do, and one fun fact about yourself. Douglas, let's start with you. Yes, hi, and um, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon um, to all of you. Uh, my name is Doug Johnson Pernsgan. I'm co founder and chief exec of Circular. Um, we are a three and a half year old business um, focused on the use of blockchain and a number of other technologies to bring greater transparency to industrial supply chains. So we work, for example, for car manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers to help them understand um, the source of raw materials that come with concerns around everything from child labor to environmental damage and increasingly using that flow of materials as a basis for um, helping to measure scope three carbon emissions embedded within the supply chain um, obviously manufacturing stuff generates an awful lot of carbon so that's what we do little fun fact about me um, uh, i started my career in the army as a bomb disposal officer so about a thousand million miles away from what i do today so i'm delighted to be involved in this panel today thank you great thank you Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Jijo Joseph. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Blockchain Services at Chainyard. Uh, so Chainyard is a uh, you know, blockchain services company based out of North Carolina in the US. Uh, so we started our blockchain journey, uh, you know, starting to do the quality assurance of Hyperledger Fabric uh, at the IBM labs. So over the last five years, we probably created more than a 30 blockchain solution, majority of them on uh, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, I live out of uh, Cochin. Uh, some of you may know it's, it's on the it's a coastal city in uh, South India. Uh, there is you no know, fun fact about me. I know people uh, read my name as Gigo or many other things instead of Jijo. Uh, so it happened. Uh, it happened in my when I when I got my school certificate out of 10th grade at the high school, you know, the, the, the professor you know, misspelled my name. And I didn't try to change that because I thought, what's there in the name, right? But, but things become worse when I joined the college in India, one of the prestigious college, you know, all these students from all over the world are there. They started calling me garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and it took me two years to figure out, uh, figure out a counter says, you know, I am garbage in gold out. <laughs> way of a uh, uh, workaround with that. Anyway, very nice to be part of the panel and I look forward to have some nice discussion. That's a brilliant story. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, today's panel is supposed to be tackling the issues of climate action and accounting, sustainability, and if distributed ledger technologies, and if yes, then how, are helping fighting uh, or helping with um, prevention of everything that is happening around climate right now. So why is climate change important to you personally and to your company? What kind of, what did bring you to this panel? Uh, that's probably a weird question because I invited you to this panel, but why did I invite you? <laughs> Jijo, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. So there's a famous uh, there's a famous quote right you know we don't inherit the earth from our uh, 
ancestors, right? We borrow it from our future children, right? So, so we, as an individual, right, we have the obligation to give it the way back to our children, the way the way we took it, right? Without making much damage, right? To reduce the carbon footprint. So that is there in each employee, each uh, uh, employee's uh, mind in our company. And being working on blockchain, you know. Uh, one thing we found that 40 to 60 percentage of the all the carbon footprint uh, happened during the supply chain, and blockchain is the one of the technologies that actually being revolutionizing the supply chain, and we find a lot of invention happening up there, right? And at this time, you know, people are working on the Paris uh, Agreement to reduce two degree, right? So, uh, you know, it is it is an excitement to be, you know, part of this journey to. Uh, Make I mean, if your contribution may be like a point zero zero one of that two degree, right? So, so I know that is why the blockchain is very important to our company and especially for each one of us. Right, Douglas. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we obviously live in a time where our collective desire for stuff is driving a, a massive acceleration in, um, you know, our collective exploitation of pe people and planet. And some of the poorest people in the world, um, you know, e exist. And I'm thinking, for example, of child laborers in the supply chains for things like cobalt used in batteries and mica used in cosmetics. Um, you know, massive exploitation of some of the poorest people in the world. And we all know, of course, that, you know, that the process of turning raw materials into products like electric vehicles is enormously carbon intensive. Um, and, and we've, you know, I think many of us were probably a little bit surprised during the period of lockdown earlier this year, um, as COVID swept across the world, how little, um, you know, our collective carbon footprint fell, about 7%, um, which is roughly what the Paris Agreement expects every year. And yes, we weren't traveling, we weren't using our cars so much, but the supply chains that we all rely on to manufacture stuff that we consume we're still worrying, and, uh, and and that's a wake up lesson for us all. Uh, and so both you know both Gijo and I are working with manufacturers in supply chain as a way of in in an attempt to try and reduce the embedded carbon within those supply chains. So you know uh, uh, to to echo the point that he made about our children's future, I completely agree. I have young children, but actually we're now faced with a situation where some of these new technologies can start to help. Yeah, it's, I, I didn't realize that it was just 7%. It's pretty scary when you think about it, because it's unsustainable yeah. to keep the world the way it was for 2020. And so, yeah. yeah. So actually, Doug, since I have you here, um, could you please uh, tell us a bit more about what you've, uh, you've done in Circular uh, around yeah. the sustainability? So, so we started the business, and we'll, we'll talk more about how this applies to blockchain things in a second, but we started the business on the premise that new technologies can unlock old problems. And we were looking for a way to try and create trust in the enormously asymmetric world of supply chains. Imagine you know, artisanal mining in the Congo or Rwanda, all the way through to you know, global consumer electronics companies or car manufacturers you know, in the US or, or Europe. Um, and, and there is no central source of the truth and a lack of trust pervades these supply chains, particularly when you're worried about concerns around environmental damage or human rights abuses. Um, and so, so that was the, the, the premise upon which we started the business. And, and then um, from 2018 onwards, we've been you know, applying an evolving solution to trying to create reliable flows of materials through supply chains, attach it information about you know, due diligence um, at, in areas of concern in order that, for example, a car manufacturer can be confident where their raw materials have come from. But when you have a reliable chain of custody or a flow of materials from start to finish in a supply chain, you can attach other attributes to that data, such as energy consumption, renewable energy versus non-renewable energy, and essentially build up scope three emissions pictures for supply chains um, that are otherwise just based on lots of very funky modeling on quite old benchmark data, which is not a tool that enables people to actually buy smarter or reduce the carbon footprint of something like, for example, an electric vehicle battery, which by the way, has an enormous embedded carbon footprint. And I'll share a slide in a bit that shows, you know, how this kind of insight actually enables you to make cars better. 
Well, actually, uh, can you let, let's stick to, it now. <laughs> to what you're yeah, talking about? I don't want to break because uh, you have a clearly, you know, sure. train is so, not there. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. And, and there's just a couple of screenshots for, from our platform. And I'm just going to try and bring this to life. The first thing to say is because I appreciate that not everybody is an expert in supply chains. Supply chains aren't linear. There are lots of participants at you know, tier five, tier four, tier three, tier two, and, and, you know, largely in that midstream of the supply chain, you know, the, the relationships between participants are relatively fluid based on the availability of materials and their price. You know, obviously purchasing on price to an appropriate quality is common. Um, so the picture on the bottom right here um, shows a, a representation of a real supply chain, supply chain for, for cobalt, which is an essential ingredient of lithium ion batteries, um, with on the left hand side a whole pile of mines and on the right hand side a car manufacturer. And over the sort of 10 months or so, and I'll, I'll refer to the graph in the background in a second and explain that, but over that, set, that period every one of these participants was involved in some way at different points in time in the flow of materials. Now, each of these plants will be using a combination of renewable energy and non-renewable energy. Some will have carbon offsets. Um, some will have concerns around human rights. Some will have concerns around um, you know, water use, for example. We're capturing data about each of these facilities. And then when you have a flow of materials, you, you understand the flow of materials through each of these participants over time, you can start to create a picture like the one behind it. So just to help you understand this, the green bars represent a number of electric vehicle batteries manufactured, you know, same car model, same battery manufactured over time. Um, and why are we talking about batteries? Well, we all believe that electric vehicles are better for the planet. Um, and of course, they don't have tailpipe emissions. But what we've done is shifted the problem to the supply chain. The point at which you pick up a key, you, the keys to your new electric vehicle, um, there's an enormous amount of embedded carbon within that supply chain, about 70% at the point at which you pick up the keys, and half of that is the battery. The battery manufacturing process is enormously carbon intensive. So in the first month and the last month in this graph, you can see very, very roughly similar number of batteries, actually slightly less in the last month. Compare the first month now, the, the blue and the yellow boxes, which represent the amount of energy consumed, renewable and non-renewable, in the manufacture of those batteries. Compare that to the final month, exactly four times higher. Real data, obviously slightly anonymized, but real data for a real car manufacturer for real batteries. And the reason for this huge difference is because of the flow of materials through the supply chain. It, in the first month, it happened to be through a whole pile of participants who were largely powering their operations with, you know, efficiently with renewable energy. Um, and in, in the final month, you know, a far dirtier, in inverted commas, supply chain. That kind of insight provides the tools that the likes of car manufacturers need to buy smarter. And we could be talking about the manufacture of anything, but fundamentally, before you spend billions on R&D to change battery chemistries and all the rest of it, actually just buying smarter can make a material difference to the amount of carbon dioxide generated in the manufacture of your goods. Um, what I'm showing you here as a principle is now being applied in a variety of supply chains. We're doing it at the moment with um, sustainable nickel. We're, we're working now with a number of car manufacturers on exactly this to give them a tool to manage carbon, the embedded carbon within their supply chains. So that's your question. Wow. That, that's, uh, I know your solution, obviously, but this is the first time I'm seeing that. And uh, that's very interesting. Um, Jujo, um, I obviously, um, the world heard about uh, know your supplier, we've, uh, or trust your supplier. We've done a lot of uh, work on it and case studies, uh, but you've also developed the rapid supplier and looking at how can trust your supplier move to sustainability. Could you tell us a bit more about it? Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, so, so the rapid supplier was launched uh, as a response to COVID in the uh, United States, right? So it is based out, based upon, it's leveraging the trust your supplier. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the IBM solution called IBM Sterling, right? So, so if I need to explain uh, uh, what rapid supplier is, you know, I need to take a minute and explain what is trust your supplier. Yeah. To, you know? uh, I'm about it, but- you, Sorry, you muted yourself for a minute. Okay, okay, so sure. Right, my, uh, hand did uh, that, okay. So, yeah. so 
so trust your supplier. Um, I mean, there's only two slides here. Let me see. Okay. Hmm. Okay, there you go. I think you can see now. Yeah. So trust your supplier is actually nothing but the digital identity of a supplier. It is shared across uh, multiple buyers in a network. So this is a major issue in a procurement area in a supply chain where a buyer is trying to find a, you know, a supplier, uh, then onboarding the supplier, then later maintaining the supplier. So onboarding the supplier today is in a procurement world take uh, you know 30 days to even three months uh, because you need to go for the process of validating that particular supplier, right? So the way it started is, let's say one buyer asked a supplier to submit a set of data. You know, data could be his financial statement, uh, the, his provenance of the data, or maybe his child labor is involved, you know, certificate of that, his, his uh, uh, environment rating, you know, all kinds of his insurance policies, his uh, licenses, all those things, right? But none of the buyers will take that as is, but they send it for very phase like Dunn and Bradstreet. Thomson Reuters, you know, those companies to verify that data, right? So once that verification comes, uh, they won't board it. But after some time, you know, maybe after three months or maybe after six months, some of his registrations, some of his registrations expires, then they need to resubmit and go through that. The companies like IBM has 18,000 plus suppliers. You know, for them, it's a large process of managing, onboarding and managing the suppliers, right? Now, this, if you look at from the supplier's point of view, Supplier is submit, submitting the same data to multiple buyers. They're submitting the IBM, then they submit to Cisco, you know, if you wanted to be a supplier of Cisco, and, you know, continue, uh, continue, you know, that journey to like, there's some, some suppliers submit to 25 buyers, right? And, uh, and it is a painful process for supplier to, to resubmit this data. So we thought about there is a uh, good opportunity for creating a, trusted identity of a supplier on a blockchain network and can be shared across multiple buyers. So we went and met IBM, IBM Bob Murphy, IBM uh, chief procurement officer, he liked the idea. So we created this uh, particular network. And uh, so, so today, if you look at that network has a large set of buyers, like in the governance board we have from JetBlue to UPS to Lenovo to IBM Cisco, you know, on the financial market, we have JP Morgan, State Street, you know, American Express, a large set of people. But on top of that, the governance board, governance board is primarily biased. We have large validators. These are the people who validate the data. We have like Dunan Bradsheet, Echo is rapid rating, you know, those Echo is uh, validate the environmental uh, rating of the company. And there's a set of uh, companies who actually use this data from the blockchain network and create new businesses on top of that, right? So what happened is like, so this, this is primarily trust your suppliers. It's a digital identity to a supplier can be used across uh, multiple buyers in the network. Now, what happened was uh, during this COVID time, right? This is my last slide. During the COVID time, uh, there is a shortage of PPP, PPE in, the, in the, all the personal protective equipments in the US market. And a lot of the hospitals and buyers organizations were trying to buy it from suppliers all over the world. And uh, they were getting, you know, poor quality. They were getting, uh, uh, you know, lead time. And they were not getting in time, you know, though the availability was an issue, lead time was an issue. So we quickly, IBM and China quickly thought, we have the identity, trusted identity of the supplier on the blockchain. And only thing missing is lead time and availability. Why don't we put combine these two using IBM Sterling and the Trust Your Supplier, and we launch Rapid Supplier Connect, where the hospitals and the healthcare organizations they could buy it through Trust Your Supplier product, uh, the PPP equipment. So this was a uh, 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 very successful. Like more than 500 companies started buying. You know, buyers and sellers they came in and started trading on this particular platform. Actually, this uh, we learned a lot of things from this COVID. You know, the one thing we learned was. Uh, Trust is the most important aspect during this, uh, such kind of event happens. And, and blockchain has history, is the only solution actually can provide that trust in the market. And I'll cover more, more of such things later. Uh, so this was about the trust, tr trust your supplier, how trust your supplier uh, uh, helped, uh, sorry, rapid supplier can help to uh, you know, manage a pandemic. Right. 
Well, that's that, that's that's interesting how you were also able to really apply something that was quite theoretical initially to real life uh, use case and something that was you know very urgent. Yeah, yeah. So what we found is uh, if you have a solid platform like this, right? When such pandemics and such issues comes up, you know you can quickly create new business models on top of it. Like think about a trusty supplier with a hundred thousand plus suppliers there in the net in the network, then we can actually launch, uh, you know, like like new business new new business models like like uh, the COVID uh, contact tracing is an example. Like you know, immediately people were able to if you have everybody has a digital identity, we could very quickly roll out that particular application on top of it. So, right. Yeah. So um, actually, um, Doug. Speaking of kind of pivoting and finding new ways of doing things, I know that uh, you have uh, a very interesting model model of build well working with your clients, where most people are thinking about consortia. Chainyard is also be- building some kind of a you know consortium or or a network of users. Could you tell me a bit more about how Circular is doing it and um, you know how how is it working or not working? Yeah. Well. So- it, it, yes, I think it's working, but um, I, obviously, by definition, a distributed ledger requires a network of participants to have any meaningful yeah. value. But um, what we tried to do, what, what, what we did do, is avoid the approach of trying to build a formal consortium. Formal legal consortia take a long time to put together. The governance is a significant overhead. Um, and, and therefore, potentially, you also significantly slow down the speed of innovation. So the approach we took was to try and create a coalition rather than a formal consortium. And let me just illustrate what I mean by this. Um, We, you know, one of our projects in the auto sector, we started with an anchor customer, Volvo Cars. And um, with that anchor customer, we started engaging battery suppliers and their tier one suppliers and their tier two, tier three suppliers. Uh, And while they all contracted to sign up to use a platform, there was no, beyond the existing commercial relationships between those participants, there was no need for them all to join a consortium, which would have obviously slowed things down. As other car manufacturers that share the same battery manufacturers, you know, sign up to use the common platform, there doesn't have to be a formal relationship between, for example, Daimler, who, you know, with whom we've, we've been working on this carbon tracking, and Volvo cars. Um, yet they both benefit from existing on a shared platform with shared supply chains, albeit obviously that there's segregation of data and information um, depending on you know, what's going on within that supply chain. And the reason we went down that approach was speed. You know, this is a new technology being applied in new ways. You want people to innovate and you don't want to be tied up in bureaucracy. The other thing is that, and this is, you know, forgive me for a bit of prejudice, formal legal consortia um, don't often stand the test of time over the very long term. And so we were trying to look at ways in which one could do this, have the benefits of a network without the disadvantages of a formal consortium. Now, from a commercial perspective, I can see how some very large technology suppliers might like a consortium because it locks their clients in. But most clients don't want to be locked in. <laughs> they get locked in because they're happy and delighted and pleased with what they're getting, not because it's too damn difficult to move. <laughs> that's yeah that's as you know I'm, I'm i'm very impressed with that idea and that, that concept i guess it also helps you to qu- quite quickly pivot and change what what you're working on and kind of expand maybe not pivot but expand um we we have to develop the roadmap i mean the purists the, the blockchain purists will say that obviously you know and we all remember the theory of the decentralized autonomous organization The reality is most of us are using a combination of technologies of which distributed ledgers is just one. Someone has to be the system architect. Someone has to be the system integrator and someone has to be the system administrator. And and of course that places a chain yard or a circular in a position of trust. Uh, We are obviously neutral actors in the supply, you know, I'm not involved in the auto supply chain as a supplier of anything except, you know, trust. And so, you know, yes, it, 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 it sort of goes against some of the true um, you know, philosophy that was distributed ledgers, but actually it's using distributed ledgers as a tool alongside other technologies it's in the real world. We may get smarter at doing all of these things in future, but at the moment, this is working. 
Um, a quick, uh, quick interme uh, intervene. We have half time and I wanted to remind everybody uh, listening and watching that you can ask questions. This is actually a live uh, talk, so we are able to answer your questions as, as we go. Uh, please use the chat uh, or the Q&A or raise your hand. Any of the options is available. We are monitoring everything. So if you have questions, please do ask them. Um, so Jijo, um, mining Bitcoin, and famously, uh, is a similar amount of energy that, that, uh, that of a medium-sized uh, town. Uh, it would seem like distributed ledger technology that is underlying the cryptocurrency would be terrible idea when it comes to sustainability and fighting climate change and all those things, right? Following the Paris Agreement. Um, so why DLT and what, what are the values that DLT brings to, uh, to the supply chain, oh, sorry, to the climate uh, action? So, so, uh... So the, you you started with the mining Bitcoin Bitcoin right I mean so 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 so, <laughs> so somebody brought to me you know this example in in uh, in early days in the U.S. gold rush right so when there were a lot of mining activities happening on gold mining people actually used uh, it was somebody told me it was more than ten million pounds of mercury was used for mining the gold so all those mercury was spilled across all the river basins and, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, water tables and everywhere it was spoiled, right? I mean, today, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, you know, we use uh, very similar, very similar pollution, you know, using electricity, I mean, using proof of work, right? So it is as equivalent to the, uh, uh, the, the mercury pollution that happened, uh, you know, 100, 200 years back. Uh, but so without fixing that, you know, whatever, whatever we, we talk about, uh, use DLT to uh, create this, uh, you know, managing the climate change, because we are, we are reaching around one percentage of uh, the world's uh, electricity usage for mining. Now we are very, reaching very close to that. that, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we're closing, I mean, we're 0.5 to 0.6 or something, and I think it's probably 1% day now. So, so that has to change, you know, the first and fundamental thing is, you know, we need to change from the, mine, uh, the mining in Bitcoin to a, in a matter of better algorithm than the proof of work, right? And the second aspect of your, your question is like how DLT is actually helping. I mean, there are some that can answer, like, give a lot of example, which comes, so I'm not getting that, that that's his, his area. But, but there are two aspects I, I, I found, right? One is before DLT itself, there are a lot of projects that were happening, a lot of initiatives like, like for deforestation, you know, tracking carbon emission, like tropical forest challenge, etc., and uh, it never became successful. And fundamentally, is because the the link was missing. The, the from these initiatives to the end user, that market connection, that market link was missing. As an example, when I go to the market, I buy something. I didn't need to know where it was coming from. There was there was a, you know we never cared about that. Today with this simple feature of transparency from blockchain, now I know where it is coming from. Now I know how much carbon footprint it created. I can compare with the two product, not really on the quality of the product, but on the lesser carbon footprint. I can just scan my phone and the blockchain network will tell me that, right? So I can be more demanding. So, so this link was the missing link which was created, you know, in the, in the past, all these events failed because they never, they said, okay, we, we didn't cut that much trees as it was. I mean, uh, we didn't create this product, but it was only, only a marketing slogan at that time. There was no direct link to the product which was created. And second and most important, that is the first innovation, you know, the, the transparency aspect of the blockchain, which is creating that. The second aspect which I found was uh, blockchain bringing this unique way of uh, incentivizing people with the coins. Like, like tokenization aspect, right? Right. As an example, let's say uh, solar coin or, you know, or uh, LED usage. You know, if you use LED, you save this much of solar or, or you, you have a, your own sol solar, uh, uh, the plant, uh, you know, you built yourself, right? You can plug it directly into the, onto the grid and uh, start, start to power the grid, right? Each one megawatt is uh, approximately 1500 pounds of uh, carbon dioxide emission. So you are saving that much carbon dioxide. So you can be 
uh, incentivized with a solar coin you know that, or, or some kind of a token that can be used to you know uh, monetize uh, uh, your effort so so this is creating these two ways are creating in a lot of innovative methods I mean, in, uh, this is creating a lot of innovation for people to create new business model in uh, using dlt to fight against uh, uh, against the climate change mm -hmm. right um Doug, actually, I have a question for you because, uh, well, you have kind of a physical solution used there, right, in the wild. If your Volvo Daimler is working with you, everything's pretty amazing. How did it happen? Like, how did you come up with this and why did you decide to use distributed ledgers? Was it that Circular was a distributed ledger company and so you wanted to apply it to this use case that you saw or maybe you had a problem and you chose uh, a DLT. And if so, then why did you choose a DLT? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, th this sounds a bit ridiculous, but in, in middle of 2017, I, I took a week off work um, because I'd got, I'd first heard about, you know, blockchain and Bitcoin when I was at British Telecom and all my, I used to run the defense and security business there. And my cryptographers were getting really excited in about 2010 about this thing called Bitcoin, which of course, you know, like most, most of us possibly we haven't heard of in 2010. Um, and, and, and the sort of the thought started percolating that, you know, perhaps blockchain might have a use beyond cryptocurrencies, of course, here we are in 2020, 10 years later, and the answer is, of course, it does. But that wasn't quite so obvious five five years ago, and um, and that thought was percolating. I took a week off work to to try and because I you never really get time to think when you're working, yeah. um, and so I took a week off work and sat in my living room and, and spent some time actually working out whether I could find a use case where I thought there was a problem of scale that was going to significantly grow in magnitude that potentially a distributed ledger could help solve um, and that that was the that was the starting point and of course you know the growth in demand for lithium-ion batteries because of the growth in demand for electric vehicles you know drives the sort of you know the, the exponential growth that we all now expect to see around electric vehicles and I thought there are problems in these supply chains which are fundamentally problems of trust and um, you know whether it is, can I trust the source of my cobalt because it's coming from the Congo, which produces 60% of the world's cobalt, and of course, child labor is endemic. Um, and, and a huge asymmetry between a car manufacturer in the US or Europe and a, an artisanal miner, and by artisanal, I mean digging with a shovel, you know, an artisanal miner in the Congo. Uh, so how can one apply a distributed ledger either on its own or alongside other technologies to help improve trust in what is a very asymmetric problem um, and one that we as society have to get our heads around if you know we're going to drive the energy transition uh, towards electric vehicles and 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 that was the, that was the genesis of it um, and uh, one of the reasons we picked hyperledger is because of your earlier question around energy use you know one of the huge advantages of a of a private permission system using different consensus mechanisms other than mining is that it requires about as much energy to run as my laptop, which is, is the right answer because the idea of consuming close to 1% of the world's electricity demand for you know, consensus is mildly insane, even if it is truly autonomous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that was one of the things that pushed us towards, I've always been a fan of open source because of course you have many brains are better than one. And if I came up with a circular protocol, lots of people would question whether or not it was sensible. So it's much, mm -hmm. much easier to piggyback off something like Hyperledger. Um, and uh, although the intention was always to focus on cobalt, which of course at the moment is our core business, we're starting to branch out into to other raw materials that have the same kind of problems. Um, our very first field trials in Hyperledger um, wrote a case study about this was actually tantalum, which is a conflict mineral mined in places like Rwanda that finds its way into capacitors in your and my phone. Same problem, artisanal mining, huge corporates at the other end of the supply chain and a problem of trust. Um, and, and we're say, basically taking that principle and trying to apply it in lots of different places now um, with, 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 with some success. Circular, the, the name of the company, which you can sort of see behind me on the wall, um, 
is, is actually the Latin word for to come together in a group. So having talked about not creating formal consortia, but creating networks, we picked the name for a reason. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, ultimately, this is about coming together in networks. Mm -hmm. yeah. so just, to, just to add to that, right, you were saying, right, you know, you know, why did we use a DLT, but could we do it without DLT, right? I mean, if there's a way to do without DLT, I suggest do it that way, because, yes. because uh, DLT, you should not uh, pull in DLT unnecessary, unless, unless you see very convincing, yeah. convincing you know, reasons for that. Totally agree with you, Gigi. Because, because actually, you know, and, and the challenge, of course, is there is, you know, if there was the United Nations Department of Responsible Sourcing, there would be someone you might trust to run a database, mm -hmm. except, you know, such a such a body, august body doesn't exist, which is why something like a distributed ledger can help to build that distributed trust. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of United Nations, uh, do you know you're much deeper into this subject than I am? Do you know of any governments or pan national organizations are exploring usage uh, of uh, DLTs for uh, uh, climate and energy and uh, sustainability? Yes. Uh, so uh, the World Economic Forum has been for a while running a, a, a sort of a, a, a panel, if you like, called the Global Battery Alliance, um, focused on this question of provenance of raw materials and also the circular economy for, for batteries and trying to create global standards. In Europe, um, the European Commission has been looking at distributed ledgers as a tool for carbon border adjustment taxes, for demonstrating traceability of raw materials, um, in, including things like recycled plastic, um, which of course also, you know, raw materials going through transformation in a supply chain. So there are, there are certainly in the space that I occupy, I can see a number of, um, you know, examples that are coming, even though they're not live yet. Yeah, I saw you, you must be knowing Interwork Alliance, right? Interwork Alliance is, you know, there's a sustainability initiative group. So they are developing a trusted solution for standardizing token based emissions, accounting credits and, uh, you know, offsetting. I mean, there's no standards exist today. So they actually that includes a framework and certification program. They both for exchanging token-based certificates and digital assets uh, tied to you know greenhouse uh, gas emission. So mm -hmm. that, that's a, that's a recent uh, initiative which started. Yeah. Do you know if anything is happening in India? So there were uh, P2P uh, energy trading was actually uh, you know there were there were people who were trying it out in a few uh, educational institutions, right? Uh, uh, then uh, on the energy side, I'm aware of only that. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, the Indians, uh, the, some of the states which started uh, were going into the, the land records and, you know, things, uh, things in that line, but not on the energy uh, carbon emission side. Right, yeah. right. Um, I would remind uh, the participants that you can ask questions anytime. You can raise your hand, you can type in. Uh, your question into the Q&A or the chat box uh, so that us know if you have any questions because I have an, a never-ending list of questions. I really like talking yeah. to those two gentlemen. Um, so uh, while we wait for questions to come in, what are some challenges that you faced with uh, when building uh, your solutions? Were they more technological? Uh, were they more um, governance issues, I don't know. So, uh, so I can start, I think Doug was kind of mentioning why he, uh, you know, uh, moved, moved away from building a consortium, right? <laughs> so, so I think uh, the, not just us, what we found is that from our consulting experience, right? Uh, most people fail finding the, uh, the right business model, right? You know, the right business model that should incentivize everybody. It should be a need for everyone joined the network, right? Uh, rather than excitement, you know, when, when, when even in this energy carbon footprint uh, place, you know, uh, everybody should, should benefit out of it, right? Uh, so the right business model is the uh, most important aspect. Uh, so uh, in our case, uh, in a trust your supplier, uh, we, we decided we, uh, the, only the suppliers would pay the network. The buyers would join for free and the buyers would in, it'll, it'll bring in the supplies into the network, right? So that, and we are, uh, and the second aspect is, uh, 
the cut again uh, was that Doug was saying the the creating the consortium and governance model. So the challenges behind that. So it depends again if your business model is uh, we have we have seen smaller business models where uh, you and only were some of your subset of vendors are involved for uh, uh, cases like a dispute resolution and things like that. But if you're creating a large consortium, uh, it took us more than one year for getting the primary agreements done with at least few of the, the initial set of people. Uh, and the governance model was also challenging. I mean, luckily uh, we were able to get uh, and limit to 18 uh, uh, larger Fortune 200 companies and there were more people who wanted to be in the governance board. Uh, and the more, uh, and the, we found that uh, there are challenges like uh, if you get so many people at the beginning, then it's very dif difficult for you to reach it in the consensus and agreement into what we should be doing. And if you have only a smaller set of people who are not to, then there is a, you know, there is an issue of people don't believe you, people don't trust you, right? So until we do an MVP, we found that you needed to have a, you know, I mean, it's, it's up to you. I, it, it depends on your use case and depends on how the market, like, you know, maybe handful of people, you know, don't go for, you know, uh, you know like dozens of people in the consortium. You develop some, then you take it to the market, then you add more people into the network. The last one, one of the challenges we found that, especially if your supply chain is crossing the countries, the laws and uh, regulations of each country, you know, will they have an impact, impact on your network, right? So, um, uh, so, but but each of those each of those will get uh, as at the time gets uh, you know going you know most of these things will get ironed out and we will have a you know, better convergence on on some of these uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. How about you, Douglas? What were the hardest problems? Um, getting a finding a pioneer customer who's prepared to try something like this that's new and be first is obviously a challenge. I mean, one of the interesting things is obviously both Chain Yard and Circular are, are sort of scale up businesses. Um, and, and, you know, we're kind of punching a little bit above our weight. And, uh, and, and particularly in a field where there are a lot of people trying to work on creating solutions, how do you gain traction? Um, how do you get one of those, how do, you, how do you become one of those few people that gains traction? We focused ruthlessly on a particular problem and looked for a pioneer customer. In our case, it was Volvo Cars, which, uh, which is now an investor of ours as well. Um, and we approached them and said, look, you know, we're working on this and we know that this is something you care about. Um, and we'd obviously been talking to a number of other car manufacturers as well in parallel and said, are you willing to try an experiment? And, and they said, yes. And, and, and the rest as kind of we've been a little bit lucky you know um, but there's always an element of luck in this but also the idea of focusing on who has the problem and might be prepared to pay to solve it is the fundamental of any business yeah yeah i was actually recently talking to someone and giving exactly that example that uh, you can't just offer services and wait for someone to to tell you what what services you should offer you have to know what to offer um, actually, we have a question uh, from the audience. Um, uh, Hiroyuki is asking, how much ratio does the blockchain-based technology currently cover the supply chain regarding climate change? Hmm. Uh, it's very early days. So at the moment, these are mapped supply chains um, for specific car manufacturers. Uh, we currently have uh, three, soon to be four car manufacturers um, and, and they obviously have some overlaps in their, in their, their suppliers, um, but it, it's early days. But of course, what we're trying to do is you get a few pioneer customers to do something, you have a few fast followers, and then hopefully you establish a new benchmark where suddenly you know, collecting certificates from your supply chain no longer is credible. Um, you establish a new benchmark, others follow. That's the idea. Right. So ask the same question in a year. We'll see how we get. I'll give you an exact percentage. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think uh, see, blockchain is like a uh, uh, like cloud in uh, in the in 15 years, 10, 12 years back, right? You know, when cloud was started, you know, people were not believing it, trusting it, right? So now people cannot think outside cloud. You know, every solution comes out. Uh, they ask, uh, you know, let's be in cloud. So yeah, in few years time time, uh, no. The, the, you know, the performance of the blockchain also improves and there will be wider acceptance. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gigi, uh, for you, um, you, as Douglas mentioned, uh, chain yard and circular are rather uh, 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 scale ups uh, companies. You are not, you know, big on the market, but you have very big names in in your portfolio now. How did you acquire your first customer? How did you build out uh, the trust your supplier? So, so the trust your supplier, like like Doug said, it was a, so we did uh, many solutions like our uh, like you know before trust your supplier for our clients as a services company. Then our CEO had this vision of you know we should be doing you know one solution by ourselves. Then we had three four ideas like like you are saying you know we were searching for the golden nail you know to use the technology, and we found about this. Uh, major issue in procurement area, right? So since we have been working with IBM at that time, we went and met uh, Bob Murphy, the CPO of IBM, uh, Chief Procurement Officer. He liked it. And uh, he was a great supporter from the day one onwards. He had uh, some 18,000 suppliers at that time, right? Even today. So they, they, they know the day-to-day -day challenges of this particular problem was. And, uh, and large companies are, I know this are, for the last 15, 10, 15 years, large companies are always looking for small companies to bring in the innovation so that they can take to the market with us. Uh, so we were at the right spot and uh, met the right people and, uh, you know, and become actually, across your supply become a really successful product. Mm -hmm. We have three minutes left, so it will be will have to be brief. But what is your hope for twenty twenty one in terms of uh, the further DLT or climate action um, activities? Uh, uh, I'm I'm seeing a transition now between you know blockchain the hype and real working examples. Uh, and, uh, and the nature of the conversations that I have with customers now don't even mention blockchain. In fact, I, I was on a, I was on a, a, a pitch to a customer um, last week. And by the time we'd finished explaining what we did and how it works and all the rest of it, they said, um, why did you choose not to use a blockchain for this? And we, said, well, we are using a blockchain. They said, but you didn't mention it. Well, no, I, didn't mention all, I didn't mention all any of the other technologies either. We'll talk about about that later and that's good because it actually shows a degree of maturity now or, or growing maturity about the technology and it's not just a, a buzzword it's a tool and and that's i think that's good news right, yeah yeah i agree with you like you know the i mean you know a few years back we used to say blockchain for you know, you know unnecessarily everywhere like now now we don't even use the word blockchain uh, we you and even chain yard as a you know, we call, call, don't call ourselves a blockchain company anymore. We call ourselves a digital transformation company with blockchain as one of the tools to en en enable you. So that realization has come, that maturity has come. Uh, so the COVID has slowed down, uh, uh, you know, a little bit, but not, not as, as we thought, because, you know, we are seeing more companies are actually, seeing as we speak, more companies are actually getting on board with the uh, new digital transformation blockchain. And, and blockchain is only 30% of the solution. And most of the clients, they don't get to see blockchain. They just see only front end with a, a user interface and they ask me, where is blockchain? You know, so, you know sometimes. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that they, they, they see only a small portion of it. And we, we have EA and uh, you know, IoT is always contributing to the blockchain, you know, and we validate IoT. And uh, AI is using the data from the blockchain for getting better intelligence. So the, the whole ecosystem has to be developed uh, for a, you know, in a better business model. Yeah. Well, this is a very good summary, uh, and I'm glad that uh, we I had the opportunity to talk to you because I learned a lot. So thank you so much for joining me, uh, and I th thank you to the audience for staying on with us and and listening to us. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Have a safe day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye.